All right. Um, everybody, can you be kindly uh, seated? Uh, we're going to begin. We have only one hour uh, for this very important session. And now, actually, we have only 50 minutes uh, to wrap up. Uh, so uh, let's begin uh, with our business. Well, honorable dignitaries on the high table, excellencies and distinguished delegates, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the joint high-level UNDP and UNESCO panel on the creative economy and the post-2015 development agenda with a focus on widening local development pathways. But before we start, uh, let's join people around the world in expressing our profound sadness at the passing of one of the world's greatest freedom fighters and a giant for justice, Nelson Mandela, and extending our deepest condolences to Madiba's family and the people of South Africa by standing up to observe a moment of silence. Thank you, and please be seated. Uh, today, we are highlighting the special edition of the Creative Economy Report 2013, published jointly by UNDP and UNESCO. Building on a decade-long multi-agency, evidence-based research and on-the-ground work with a large number of local communities, including the publications of the first UN Creative Economy Report in 2008 and the second edition in 2010. This 2013 special edition accomplishes the following three things. First, it explores diverse pathways to development through the culture and creative industries. Two, it analyzes the ways in which they can uh, be strengthened and widened to achieve the expected results of inclusive social and economic development. And three, it points out that the creative economy and cultural industries can indeed contribute immensely towards achieving inclusive and sustainable growth when every country, every city, every community, and every individual is able, enabled to unleash their infinite inner energy and creativity. In this context, allow me to refer to two pertinent questions from Nelson Mandela. I quote, there is no passion to be found playing small in settling for a life that is less than the one you can capable of living, unquote. The second, and once a person is determined to help themselves, there is nothing um, that can stop them. So we all agree that in every individual, rich or poor, men or women, everywhere, there is that this in it infinite energy and creativity. And our job here is to provide them with the opportunity to unleash that infinite creativity and energy to determine, uh, to help, uh, to determine, help them to determine themselves and lead the kind of life that they can, uh, they are capable of living with their creativity. And that is what the UN system and hopefully through this special edition is trying to do. Uh, so let me recognize the joint high level panel at the high table. On my right, my esteemed leader, Madam Helen Clark, the UNDG chair and administrator of UNDP. To her uh, right uh, is uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Patel, uh, chef of the cabinet of the president of the General Assembly of the 68th session of the of the General Assembly. And to my left is His Excellency, Assistant Director General for Culture, UNESCO, on behalf of Her Excellency, the DG of UNESCO, Irina um, uh, uh, Bokonova. And to his left is His Excellency Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Peru to the UN, His Excellency, Mr. Gustav Mez Gurdjieff and the chair of the group of Friends on Culture and Development. 
and last not least, to his left, His Excellency Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Brazil to the UN, His Excellency Antonio de Aguiar Patriata. I'm now very honored to invite my esteemed leader, uh, Helen Clark, to make her statement. Thank you very much, uh, Wai Ping. Uh, excellencies, uh, my colleague, uh, the Assistant Director General for Culture at UNESCO, and everyone gathered today for the presentation here in New York of, of this very well presented and prepared report on the creative economy for 2013, widening local development pathways. And we're here to consider also how a report like this might inform the design of the post-2015 development agenda. Of course, with the 2015 target date for the MDGs fast approaching, and with deliberations uh, well underway on the next agenda, uh, including in the very important open working group of the General Assembly on the SDGs, this report on the role of the creative economy in development is very, very timely. It was in May this year that the United Nations System Task, Force, the Task Team report on post-2015 noted the need to have new development pathways which encourage creativity and innovation in the pursuit of inclusive, equitable, and sustainable growth and development. And this message has been echoed in feedback from the global conversation, which the UN development system facilitated around post-2015, and in the discussions of member states. This report, the Creative Economy Report, for this year is the result of a good partnership between UNESCO and the Office for South-South Cooperation, which is hosted by UNDP. It reviews 80 culture and development programs which have been supported and or implemented by UN country teams in those countries. These include programs funded in 18 countries and territories by what we knew as the Spanish Fund, the MDG Achievement Fund, and initiatives supported by UNESCO's International Fund for Cultural Diversity. Based on the evidence of how many countries and communities are harnessing their creative economy for development, the report identifies opportunity for culture and the sectors associated with it, both to drive and enable inclusive and sustainable development, including at the local level. The report shows how culture and the creative sectors are actually in practice driving innovation and entrepreneurship in many countries and stimulating economic growth, generating jobs and raising people's incomes. The numbers speak for themselves. In 2011, the last year for which we have figures, world trade in creative goods and services reached $624 billion per annum, which was twice that of what it was a decade before. The creative industries make significant contributions to the world's highly developed economies. Think Hollywood, uh, think uh, other centers with very, very big uh, creative sectors, generating jobs and incomes from music, entertainment, film, and other sectors. But of course, this is increasingly happening in developing countries too. Think Bollywood. Overall, the exports of creative goods to the world uh, from developing countries reached 43% of the global creative industries uh, trade with an annual growth rate of over 13% between 2002 and 2008. So these sectors support inclusive growth by offering opportunities not only to the highly skilled in these sectors but also to people uh, considered unskilled or marginalised but who have considerable creative talent and proud cultures to draw on. Cambodia, for example, drew on a program supported by the Millennium Development Goal Achievement Fund to act in the following ways. At the community level, the program supported individual entrepreneurs and business development. With training in small business management and marketing, many hundreds of local producers and artisans were able to improve the management of their small businesses and their marketing. As a result, those in the program, the majority of whom were women, 
lifted their sales of handicrafts by 18% and their incomes went up too. The program also worked with uh, local authorities and other relevant actors to support their capacity to design, implement and monitor policies and programs aimed at lifting the cultural sector. And that included training for local leaders, traders, producers, NGO partners, boosting their understanding of trade procedures and processes, and lifting their ability to analyse relevant trade legislation and identify and get access to new markets. The program also targeted policy at the highest level of government in Cambodia. Support was provided to partners to develop Cambodia's living human treasure system. And through this system, artists and craftspeople are now receiving a regular financial allowance in return for their commitment to pass on their skills and knowledge. Following broad stakeholder consultations, this system was implemented in Cambodia after being approved by royal decree in 2010, and it covers 17 defined skill areas which are deemed to be exemplary bearers of Cambodia's intangible cultural heritage. This is really a very, very exciting initiative. Now, the report emphasizes that as well as stimulating job creation and inclusive growth, culture, and creativity have significant non-monetary value. And that contributes to inclusive social development and can contribute to reconciliatory processes too. Investing in culture and the creative sectors helps foster civic engagement, dialogue between peoples and understanding, and that helps produce a peaceful and enabling environment for development. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, the MDG Achievement Fund supported local and national partners who were working to heal the wounds of communities which had been torn apart by conflict. And the initiative supported partners to develop relevant school curricula and educational materials, facilitate the exchange of students between communities, and launch a public awareness campaign aimed at advancing mutual understanding between peoples and their cultures and their faiths. An evaluation of the program found that in 84 primary schools, the cross-cultural understanding of the students was greatly enhanced, and as well, support was provided to restore significant religious buildings in places where that religion was a minority faith as important symbols of multicultural society. So when we look ahead, more could be done to promote the role of the creative sectors and culture in development. It can, as I say, be generating inclusive and sustainable growth and also contributing to building more peaceful and harmonious communities and countries. The UN development system is very committed to supporting countries in these efforts. Just five years ago, culture was mentioned in only 30% of all the UN development assistance frameworks negotiated with governments. Uh, last year, it was referenced in 70% of the agreements, so that was more than doubling uh, within a five-year period. The UN Development Group has a task team on culture and development, which is uh, co-led by UNESCO and UNDP, and it aims to ensure that we are able to respond well to the growing interest of the member states in initiatives which are linking creativity and culture to development, including through South-South cooperation. Even so, it's not uncommon to see investments in culture losing out to competing priorities. And the rigorous data collection and analysis to inform policy is all too often missing. Acknowledging the role of the creative economy within the post-2015 agenda as both this driver and enabler of human and sustainable development could help change that, could help change the priority given to culture and creativity. I'm personally convinced that if we harness the power of creativity and culture, it does help countries diversify their economies and connect local producers of cultural and creative goods to global value chains. That will bring broader intangible benefits to communities too. And so from a UNDP perspective, uh, 
we very much value working with program countries uh, to these ends, and we recommend the reports and its recommendations to all of you as worthy of study for those uh, looking for new angles through which to uh, promote inclusive and sustainable development. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Administrator, for your inspirational statement. Uh, I'm now honored to invite His, His Excellency uh, Frances Francesco uh, Banderin, the Assistant Director General for Culture of UNESCO, to deliver his statement on behalf of his DG. So you have the Thank you very much, uh, Yiping, um, Mrs. Helen Clark, uh, Ambassador Battelle, Ambassador Mezzaquadra, Ambassador Patriota. Um, the Director General, as you know, is uh, representing our organization in, at the state funeral of Nelson Mandela in Johannesburg, so she regrets not to be able to be with us. She asked me to uh, represent her and to welcome you jointly with the UNDP uh, in the presentation of the Creative Economy Report Special Edition. I would like also to uh, acknowledge and welcome uh, the presence of some guests. We have uh, uh, Carla Fonseca, who is an expert of the creative economy, and then two UNESCO artists for peace, Mrs. Mr. Danilo Perez and uh, Nicole Slack-Jones. They are here sitting and thank you very much for joining us. We're very pleased also that this event is uh, now transmitted live uh, for the benefits of the participants uh, uh, of the Intergovernmental Committee of the Convention for the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, a very a convention very much linked to the themes that we are discussing today. It's, uh, its committee is sitting now in, um, in Paris. Uh, it's been convened uh, uh, in this annual meeting and uh, uh, they are uh, connected with us uh, via, via web. Now, uh, we have launched uh, uh, three weeks ago in Paris, uh, during the General Conference of UNESCO, uh, this publication um, in a, in a, as a culmination of a, a long process. Uh, at that time, uh, um, many of the people here present were attending, and also you, Mrs. Clark, has sent a video message. And uh, what we said at that time is that this uh, report builds on a very long history of commitment of the organization for uh, placing culture in the international development agenda, uh, a commitment that culminated uh, this year in many events, including a very important conference that we held in Hanzhou in China in May this year that uh, issued uh, a, an important uh, statement and the Hanzhou Declaration, and also a debate that took place here in the in room next to here, the trusteeship room, uh, with the presence of the Secretary General. And I think that all these events and the long history of commitment of UNESCO and many other UN bodies for culture and development and now opened the ground for a new resolution that was uh, adopted just uh, days ago uh, here, here in New York. Um, since the 80s, UNESCO is uh, uh, advocating the role of culture and development. I would like just to recall that under the leadership of one of the Secretary General of the UN, Perez de Cuellar, in 1996, a very important report was issued, uh, Our Creative Diversity. And in the 90s, but in 98, we had a very important conference in Stockholm and a very important conference in Florence in 99, jointly with the World Bank. Uh, at that time, um, the uh, issue of culture was already, has already been established as an important dimension for development and opened up in the year after the year 2000 many developments, including the uh, approval of important UNESCO international treaties, such as the Convention uh, for Intangible Heritage, was approved in 2003, and the Convention uh, on the Promotion of Diversity of Cultural Expression that I just mentioned that was adopted in 2005. Uh, the report that we are presenting today sends a very clear message. The creative economy is a powerful economic motor that generates employment and income, and at the same time, it's a source of social cohesion, of identity and dignity. And because of this dual nature, the creative economy encompasses the social, economic and environmental dimensions of development, which enable it to be truly sustainable. I think, um, Helen, you just mentioned very impressive figures of uh, the creative economy, and this is a, a, a booming sector in the world, and especially in the global south. Um, we have figures uh, that show that exports of creative economy, uh, creative goods, are increasing, have increased of 12% annually in the past 10 years. And more and more countries are investing in culture as a driving force for sustainable development, 
talking about China, Brazil, India, Indonesia, where in this last country the sector represents well 10% of GDP. Just days ago, we had a very important meeting in Bali, in Indonesia, with the presence of the President and many important uh, economists, including Amartya Sen, to discuss this issue, and a very important declaration called the Bali Promise was issued at that time. I'm not going to uh, 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 say make more many cases, because uh, Helen has done it already, uh, but certainly we have uh, now a records in this book and in this report many examples around the world of the importance of uh, culture as an enabler and, and driver of uh, economic development. Uh, it is uh, now uh, recognized, and I think the resolution that just passed uh, is a clear example of this, that culture has a, a, a transformative power, and not only uh, uh, for jobs and revenue, but also for non-monetary benefits. Uh, I think you all know a very important case that we always use, that is the cultural-led regeneration that has transformed the city of Medellin in Colombia uh, and has reduced dramatically uh, violence in that city. But the, anywhere in the world, uh, we go to Mali, you know, another you know, country troubled by conflict, uh, we have a, an important festival, the Maya Entrepreneurship Festival, that has strengthened community development through performance and exhibition and has driven local ownership. So there is a, a shift clearly underway uh, across the world uh, and we need now the right policies and the capacities to sustain it and shape it and I think this report contributes to that. A report shows that the creative sector is not like another sector of the economy because it relies heavily on informal cultural processes and institution on cultural capital, cultural capital accumulated through centuries in communities and very often is represented by uh, micro, small size enterprises. Uh, capital is often raised from informal sources, from families and friends, and this reduces the uh, needs of a public subsidy and regulation. Um, the picture that is portrayed by the report shows the need to think, think it over again uh, and reflect on the place of informal creative activities in the wider economy and, of course, on modalities of, to support it. The report shows also how this challenge can be overcome and puts forward concrete and actionable uh, recommendations. I believe that it breaks uh, new grounds uh, by examining the creative economy through many case studies and from the perspective of the local actors. Um, the report is, is a book, but it's also accompanied by another document, a web documentary. Uh, that we have wanted as a, you know, a lively uh, demonstration of uh, uh, stories, uh, videos, interviews, a lively demonstration of the importance of culture in development. We've done this uh, all together with UNDP. This was a very, an excellent cooperation uh, with the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation and, of course, also with the two other organizations that have accompanied this process, the World Intellectual Property Organization and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, had, had issued the two previous uh, um, uh, reports. I think the report could not come at a better time because uh, this is the moment which countries are discussing ways you know, to uh, frame culture in the millennium in the future, the land development goals in the post-2015. And it's a moment in which every country is also seeking cross-cutting multipliers of progress and new innovative solutions to shape a new sustainable development agenda for the post-2015. So I think it's in the importance of culture and the creative economy as enablers and drivers comes at the very, very right moment. I think it's now time to accelerate the pace together, all together, and place culture at the heart of the post-2015 sustainable development agenda. Thank you very much to all for your support and for your cooperation. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Bendrin, for your important statement. Uh, I am now very pleased to uh, invite uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Poletti Patel, Chef de Cabinet of the President of the UN General Assembly, John Ash, uh, to give her uh, remarks on behalf of the President of the General Assembly. Madam, you have the floor. Thank you. I thank you. Distinguished panelists and speakers, excellencies, distinguished guests, 
Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the President of the General Assembly, His Excellency John W. Ash, I would like to convey his sincere gratitude to UNESCO and UNDP for convening this joint high-level panel highlighting the special edition of the Creative Economy Report 2013. As you may be aware, the President of the General Assembly has been a long-time champion of initiatives, programs, and platforms that promote South-South and triangular cooperation, including those which lead to economic development through creative industries. As the report we are here to discuss so clearly highlights, this economic sector offers developing countries outstanding potential and will likely play an increasing role in our quest for sustainable development post-2015. Ladies and gentlemen, in the Rio Plus 20 outcome document, our world leaders recognized, and I quote, the natural and cultural diversity of the world and that all cultures and civilizations can contribute to sustainable development, unquote. Likewise, the General Assembly has adopted a number of resolutions that take up the matter of culture and development, with the most re recent at its 66th session. In this resolution, member states agreed that culture, and I quote again, is an essential component of human development, represents a source of identity, innovation, and creativity for the individual and for the community, and is an important factor in social inclusion and poverty eradication, end quote. The resolution goes on to say how culture can play an important role in reaching our development goals. In a few days, the second committee of the General Assembly will consider a draft resolution on culture and development, which builds upon previous resolutions, calls for greater dialogue in the Assembly on the contribution of culture to the post-2015 development agenda, and mandates a high-level event to take place on this very issue. Investing in the creative economy reaps vast rewards for our societies, leading to valuable innovation, entrepreneurship, artistic expression, and enhanced quality of life. Although the true value that the creative industries bring to individuals and societies cannot always be measured, they are one of the main driving forces of development, bringing transformative change to the global, national, and local levels. The Creative Economy Report 2013 highlights that investments in cultural capital tend to accrue in larger socioeconomic benefits. The cultural sector is also particularly dynamic and growing rapidly. In the last decade, global trade in cultural goods and services more than doubled. At the same time, we must also consider the broader benefits to individuals, societies, and to our world at large. The exportation of culture indeed does provide economic value. Yet, at the same time, it enriches us as individuals, leads to greater understanding of other customs, and supports social inclusion and empathetic societies. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us to ensure that all are well aware of the true value of culture and creativity to sustainable development, as well as the positive spillover effects to other sectors and industries. Investing in creativity is not just a pleasure we enjoy. It is a sound decision with numerous benefits. In order to fully take advantage of such benefits, the Creative Economy Report states that more capacity and knowledge are needed at the local level in the cultural and creative sectors. Particularly at the village or community level, people are often unaware of the opportunities that exist and how to harness them for maximum benefit. Filling that knowledge gap, ensuring that policymakers become aware of what individuals and local communities have to offer, and identifying the needs and obst obstacles would help all to foster this growth. As the title of this special high-level panel suggests, 
promoting widening local developmental pathways also, also requires effective partnerships that involve the private sector and all relevant actors at the local level. Another critical factor for successful creative economies is investing in new talent and supporting cultural entrepreneurs in fields such as business management, ICTs, or social networking, and providing better infrastructure to the creators and their broader networks. Cities and local authorities, the hubs that foster the creative economy worldwide, will have a key role to play here, as well as in promoting economic development and job creation, especially for the youth who thrive on culture and creativity. The cultural and creative industry offer enormous potential for bettering our homes, our societies, our environment, and our understanding of those who are different from us. We are committed to creating an inclusive and universal post-2015 development agenda, precisely because we believe that prosperity should be available to all. Culture is not only a pathway to increased prosperity, it is a form of prosperity itself. We look forward to our continued discussion on this issue, and we are confident that the Creative Economy Report 2013 will provide useful insights on how to increase the benefits of creative and cultural programs and industries. I thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chef de Cabinet, for your inspirational statement. Um, we have uh, two very important and champion countries in the UN culture and development agenda uh, process. And they are here on the podium, uh, the ambassador and the PR of Peru and the ambassador and PR of Brazil. And now I have the honor to first invite His Excellency, the ambassador of Peru, to give his uh, comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Liping. Ambassador Batel, Chief of Cabinet of the President of the UN Assembly, Mr. Bandarin, Assistant Director General of UNESCO for Culture, Ma'am Helen Clark, Administrator of the UNDP, Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Group of Friends and Culture and Development, I thank you for this opportunity to briefly comment on the latest United Nations Creative Economic Report. I will seek to highlight the contribution of culture to inclusive and sustainable development in economic terms, while further providing key non-monetary benefits in achieving social cohesion, promotion of creativity, and celebrating diversity. As has been mentioned by Director General, a cornerstone on the matter, the report Our Creative Diversity, was issued in 1996 by the World Commission on Culture and Development under the presidency of Ambassador Javier Pérez de Cuellar, former Secretary General of this organization. As stated in its foreword, development could no longer be seen as a single uniform linear path, path for this would inevitably eliminate cultural diversity and experimentation and dangerously, dangerously limit man, human, humankind's creative capacities in the face of a treasure past and an unpredictable future. Culture is a central variable in explaining different patterns of change and an essential determinant, if not the essence itself, of sustainable development since attitudes and lifestyles govern the ways we manage all our non-renewable resources. Almost 18 years later, substantive work has been accomplished. The Millennium Development Goals acknowledge the importance of culture for their achievement. We adopted the 2001 Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity, the 2003 Convention on Intangible Cultural Heritage and the 2005 Convention for the Diversity of Cultural Expression followed. In 2012, the Rio Plus 20 Summit acknowledged that all cultural cultures can contribute to the future we want. 
calling for a holistic and integrated approaches onto sustainable development. And this year, the Hansu Declaration made a sound call for placing culture at the heart of sustainable development policies. Most importantly, culturally driven ways of imagining, making, and innovating are enhancing livelihoods at the local level all over the developing world. A people-centered development emerges, providing us a strong sense of identity and social cohesion. This is all very clear for us Peruvians, for relatively new creative and cultural industries are booming in our country. We are sustainably developing formerly neglected endowments, namely, namely our millinery cultural heritage and our mega diversity. Actual change of values has been established, for instance, around native crops as quinoa or cotton. Creative cooks and fashion designers, small and large entrepreneurs and investors, and governmental promotion are all fostering new opportunities for non-traditional exports, including sustainable cultural tourism. Most importantly, peasants from indigenous communities still facing poverty and social exclusion are being empowered not only through economic development, but through intercultural dialogue and wider recognition of the intangible cultural heritage they bear. In Peru, as in many other developing countries, creative and cultural industries are fostering more diversified, stable, and inclusive economies and societies. The youth is being engaged through new jobs being creative, created. Structures established by a sustainable extracting activities are progressively being transformed. Traditional knowledge is being recovered as a valuable means for transit to new sustainable production and consumption, consumption patterns. To these aims, good practices skillfully documented by the UN Creative Economic Report as case studies are particularly relevant. As we approach the deadline established for the Millennium Development Goal and thus look forward to a post-2015 development agenda. The UN General Assembly Resolution on Cultural and Sustainable Development to be adopted shall consensually recognize the role of culture as an enable, enabler and a driver of sustainable development, along with its important contribution to the three dimensions of the latter. This indeed reflects the views of our group of friends launched last September. We have come this far, but we should go farther. The international community is yet to give due consideration to cultural and sustainable development in the elaboration of the post-2015 development agenda. In this regard, the Group of Friends seeks to integrate culture within all development policies and programs in line with international normative instruments. We look forward to the report of the Open Working Group on Sustainable Developing, on Developing Goals, granting culture a central role. And to this end, specific targets and indicators should be developed. We therefore welcome the UN Creative Economic Report, not only for the good practices documented, but for the 10 keys to forging new pathways for development that it provides. Within those keys, we would particularly like to highlight the needs for revealing opportunities through mapping local assets, for investigating the crucial connections between the formal and informal sectors, for analyzing the critical success factors, and for investing in local capacity building and sustainable creative enterprise developments. For example, by improving infrastructure for distribution and networks for creators and communities. I shall conclude by stressing that we find this report a very useful, constructive, and timely contribution from UNESCO and UNDP for the future we want. Thank you for your participation and your support in this important matter. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, um, Meza uh, Gudra, for your uh, important statement. And uh, I now have the pleasure and honor to invite His Excellency Ambassador Antonio Diego uh, Pachato uh, of Brazil. Ambassador, you have your floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yiping Zhou. Uh, and let me also thank previous speakers for their enlightening comments. Uh, 
Helen Clark from UNDP, uh, our friend from UNESCO Bandarin, Ambassador Patel, and Ambassador Mesa Quadra of Peru. It is a pleasure to take part in this event focusing on the role of creativity and culture as drivers and enablers of inclusive and sustainable development, intended to promote UNESCO's special edition of the Creative Economy Report 2013, widening local development pathways, which confirms creative industries as one of the fastest growing sectors of the world economy. Indeed, uh, as I look at this document, I think of former Minister of Culture, Gilberto Gil in Brazil, who helped to in introduce this item into the United Nations agenda. I know he would be very proud of uh, this publication. And as some of the previous uh, uh, statements have highlighted, in its outcome document, The Future We Want, um, Rio Plus 20 recognizes that all cultures and civilizations can contribute to sustainable development. It also encourages the promotion of investment in important sectors of creative economies. In fact, more than a dozen paragraphs of the future we want relate to culture. But let me also commend UNESCO for its resolution 37C64, which requests the Director General to pursue advocacy for the role of culture as an enabler and driver of sustainable development with a view to integrating culture in the post-2015 development agenda, while highlighting the role of culture and creative industries in poverty alleviation through job creation and income generation. In line with our national experience, Brazil will continue to fully support UNESCO in this important endeavor. In our experience, the contribution of culture to accelerating progress covers a wide range from cultural industries to cultural tourism, from tangible and intangible heritage to social inclusion. It could be considered as an additional pillar of sustainable development in that it articulates and contributes to a balance between the economic, social, and environmental pillars. During the last decade, the Brazilian government has prioritized the eradication of poverty and has almost reached this goal with more than 40 million Brazilians having risen out of poverty through social policies that are allowed for the provision of basic needs. Those policies have increased domestic production, generating jobs and economic development. And throughout this process, larger segments of our society begin to consume cultural goods and entertainment, as well as to engage in domestic tourism. And we have come to recognize culture as an integral part of the country's development strategy and as a sector which generates income, employment, and export earnings. An initial survey conducted by the Ministry of Culture in 2004 collected data from more than 320,000 cultural enterprises, concluding that cultural industries were responsible for 1.6 million jobs, representing 4% of the country's workforce at the time. Further studies conducted in 2008 revealed that the core creative industries plus related industries and supporting activities account for more than 21%, meaning 7.6 million jobs, or 16% of the Brazilian gross domestic product. To further support the sector, the Ministry of Culture created the General Coordination for the Economy of Culture in order to articulate concerted multidisciplinary policies with other ministries and relevant institutions at federal, state, and municipal levels. Allow me to highlight three among the many policies adopted by the Brazilian government to promote economic development and social inclusion through culture. In the first place, since 1992, Brazil has promoted cultural financing through the National Program for Support of Culture, uh, also known as the Juané Law, named after a former diplomat, actually, who was Minister of Culture, Ambassador Sergio Juané, uh, through which support for cultural initiatives may be deducted from tax expenses. Proposals for funding through this mechanism are approved by the National Commission for Cultural Incentives, which holds yearly meetings throughout all regions of Brazil. For the last 20 years, this mechanism has supported 35,000 cultural initiatives, and between 2003 and 2011 alone, approximately 3 billion U.S. dollars were invested in the cultural sector, making the Juanet Law by far the most important incentive for cultural investment in the country. Second, another innovative mechanism implemented in 2004 are the Pontos de Cultura, or we might translate them as cultural hotspots, through this program, approximately 3,700 existing cultural initiatives were identified throughout the country, and these centers then received direct financing and equipment, such as computers, internet connectivity, cameras, and video equipment, from the Ministry of Culture, 
in order to enhance their capacities as producers of cultural contents, and this policy has helped to promote greater connectivity and distribution among the productive chains of the cultural sector, it has been used as a model for similar initiatives implemented in Argentina, Paraguay, and Cape Verde. And third, this past August, Brazil launched its most ambitious policy regarding cultural consumption, the Vale Cultura, or cultural coupon. It is a government program which offers a credit in the amount of 50 reais, approximately $25 a month, for workers who earn up to five minimum wages, about $1,500 a month. With this resource, the workers and their families are entitled to purchase books, instruments, music, CDs or DVDs, as well as to attend cinema, theater, and museums. These resources are partly tax incentives that allow more than 48 million companies to benefit from exemptions while offering their employees access to cultural consumption. Initially, the estimated volume of potential resources is 3.5 billion, benefiting 17 million Brazilian citizens. The effect of this policy on the expansion of the cultural market for goods and services within the country is expected to be profound and has yet to be fully measured. In our experience, culture also enables environmental sustainability at various levels, through the intrinsic links between cultural diversity and biodiversity, through its influence on consumption patterns, and through its contribution to sustainable environmental management practices as a result of local and traditional knowledge systems. In this regard, the Sustainable Amazon program seeks to promote the development of biotechnology within the region in close coordination with 160 indigenous groups of different linguistic backgrounds who represent a valuable source of traditional knowledge regarding sustainable ecolog ecological processes. Uh, in concluding, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to quote from a statement by Director General Irina Nabokova herself, who states that, and I quote, culture is what we are. It is the wellspring of collective imagination, meaning and belonging. It is also a source of identity and cohesion at a time of change. It is a source of creativity and innovation. No society in the world can flourish without culture. No development can be sustained without it. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, for your very important statement. Uh, I'm now very pleased to invite uh, His Excellency Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Brazil, uh, Ambassador uh, Patriota. Uh, oh, you just spoke. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I switched the, uh, probably I switched the order. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I think it is, uh, okay. Um, my apology. I think I um, give the floor first to the Ambassador of Brazil. Yes, okay. No, we, ha we have, yeah, three we have Peru yeah. and Ambassador, right? Yeah, we're done. Yeah. Okay. Now we have uh, three guests. Good, okay. Well, thank you so very much. And uh, I really wanted to uh, invite you, everybody, uh, to join me uh, in giving a big applause to our dignitaries on the high table for their inspirational statement. Thank you. Okay, so we are barely managing our time, but we have very important uh, element uh, of this session that we have invited uh, three, one expert um, from Brazil, Anna, uh, who has been with us uh, in the last uh, few years, since 2005, I think, uh, championing the uh, agenda of South Us and also uh, the Creative Economy uh, 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 Initiative. So I would like to probably uh, invite her to give probably a few uh, Reflections as an expert, you have probably two minutes uh, if you can manage. Um, expert supposed to manage, right? Uh, okay. Um, all right. Anna, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm very honored to represent a vast team of creative economy experts from all different countries, walks of life, and complementary experiences who contributed to the seminal report. Particularly, I'd like to publicly recognize the importance of the program managed by Mr. Francisco Simplicio whose relentless efforts in promoting the creative economy agenda, most especially in developing countries, has been spectacular. And thanks to this most significant work and to the constant support of Mr. Su, 
Our developing countries have received an important guidance and contribution over the past years, such as a conference given by President Ash at the Federation of Industries in Sao Paulo back in 2007 during a key international conference on the creative economy as a development strategy, but it just feels like ages ago. I had the pleasure to be involved also in the previous editions of the Creative Economy Report, as has just been said, and can only acknowledge the crucial partnership between UNESCO and the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation, two institutions that by their legitimacy, competence, and widespread reach have been catalyzing progress in the understanding of the creative economy as a development engine in its most integral form. Due to time constraints, I'd like to pick just one out of the 10 key recommendations listed in the uh, new release of the Creative Economy Report, the one that emphasizes the need and the opportunity to invest in creativity, innovation, and sustainable creative enterprise development across the value chain. Creative industries chains tend to be long and can be inclusive, provided important conditions are put in place, capacity building, access to credit, cross-sector policies, and many more, as detailed in the report fundamental to turn creativity into innovation. The fact that we have a long way ahead of us in this direction gives extra importance of the spillover effects of the creative, economy, or the creative industries on the economy at large, what is normally recognized as the creative economy. Strengthening the possibilities that developing countries can use their creativity and the creativity of their people to overcome challenges inherited from the 19th and 20th centuries and to take most advantage of the opportunities presented by our current times. Just as a brief example, a creative and dynamic fashion design industry adds a spectacular value and competitiveness throughout the chain, from textile manufacturers struggling to keep their businesses active to a multitude of workers at the bottom of the pyramid. In Brazil alone, this long chain is the biggest employer of women in the services sector, all the way from top models to slum dwellers. The same effect is visible and holds true for gastronomy in Peru, design in Argentina, audiovisual in Chile, architecture in Mexico, music in Colombia, and so forth. As someone working in the field, I'm persuaded that, as the Creative Economy Report rightly emphasizes, supporting the development of the creative and cultural entrepreneurs is the only possible way to achieve, at the same time, personal satisfaction, professional fulfillment, and economic autonomy. We can't have peace of mind having no peace of pocket. Three key elements underpinning the concept and the practice of development as freedom, a concept so much sought after in the speeches of many of our policymakers, but still in the early stages of understanding and implementation in most of our countries. The Creative Economy Report helps us give guidance and depth to those who know that creativity is the most important, non transferable economic asset of our times, deeply rooted in cultural diversity and propelled by science and technology. Thank you again, UNESCO and the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation for shedding further light on the importance of the creative economy as a development strategy consolidated in the Creative Economy Report and hopefully in the initiatives yet to come from your commitment and partnership. Thank you, Anna. Um for your very important uh, reflection. And uh, I have now um, the honor to introduce two worldly renowned uh, uh, artists uh, with us. Uh, we have uh, Danielo Perez, a UNESCO artist for peace since 2012. And uh, uh, he is an, has a, an extraordinary career uh, in music industry. Uh, and uh, uh, you have his bio, so I'm not going to introduce much. So uh, could you, um, Mr. Uh, Perez, from an artist perspective, uh, share with us um, how music and the music industry can contribute to development? And if you have one example, uh, that would be super. Uh, so you probably also have two minutes. Or <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Good afternoon, distinguished panels and guests. When I'm asked how do I see music and contribute to development, I have to start by first addressing the power of, of music as a tool for social change while explaining how music works in the brain. Today we have scientific proof that music helps with brain development, concentration, memory, creativity, and many other aspects of human growth. There are several social behaviors that are practiced through learning and improvising through music. For example, an effective musical improvisation requires listening, sharing, and taking turns. 
values such as responsibility, individual development as a soloist, community development as a band, supporting member of a community when backing a soloist, and many others are learned in the creative process. Music also helps children suffering from extreme poverty escape the harsh reality of streets and give a child an opportunity to express themselves in healthy, appropriate settings, improving their, their self-esteem. It also gives structures in time of leisure, and when they get to be young adult, music can help them study abroad, work to earn money, and become productive citizens. After being mentored by my father since 1967, using music as a tool for change, creating a foundation that provides music education to underprivileged children, founding a jazz festival, touring and directing a creative music institute, I have seen how music changed people. Regarding the music industry in 2003, when most people thought it was impossible to have a jazz festival in Panama. Ten years later, in 2013, we realized the Panama Jazz Festival had created hundreds of jobs and developed cultural tourism by attracting over 200,000 people to the city. As a creative industry, the festival has an economic impact on big and small business, such as on hotels and street vendors. As a matter of fact, many street vendors depend on the jazz festival to buy their school supplies and of their children's education. As an added value, the festival has proven to be an important complement to social and community development, enriching local amenities and attracting young professionals to a UNESCO World Heritage Site by making it safer, fighting violence with creative music, and raising the level of awareness of all individuals in the community. Regarding education, we envision Panama as an audition hub for admission and scholarship to the best music in the United States. Today, we have announced more than $3 million in international scholarship. Many of those have been awarded to Latin American students of extreme poverty. Because I believe creative education can shape modern economies, in 2009, I accepted Berkeley College of Music invitation to open an institute in Boston. This leadership institute is redefining the medium of university by unlocking the power of creative music and encouraging a student to be a part of their process, of their transformational process. Based on the real experience that you can get at Berkeley, plus the input of world artists, renowned and talented students, the Institute is becoming an incubator of new musical ideas. It is a place where creative music, social work, interconnective learning, and restoration of, of ecology are united towards one common goal, to develop the creative musical ambassadors of the new millennium. Only this year, we have performed and developed creative projects in many diverse places, such as homeless shelter, psychiatric hospital, important jazz festival, and create social exchanges in Paris, Panama, Dominican Republic, Valencia, and West Africa. I see a bright future if we can redefine really our thinking about creativity, education, and culture in a way that connects with society, economy, and government. As a UNESCO artist for peace, I support the notion that music and the art are no longer the icing on the cake of our public life, but the essential ingredients in the economical and cultural growth of our countries. Thank you very much. Okay, Th thank you so much um, from an a, a artist's perspective. Uh, since we don't have time, but we cannot leave this room without hearing the beautiful voice and uh, um, a message uh, from our eminent and worldly well-known uh, artist, uh, Nico, uh, from Louisiana. And uh, uh, I think uh, we would uh, probably hear her few words and then inspire us a little bit uh, from a, a musician's point of view. Uh, we need some energy. Uh, Nico, please. Thank you. Madam Administrator Helen Clark, uh, Mr. Assistant Director General for Culture, Francesco Vanderine, Excellency, Chef de Cabinet of the President of the General Assembly, Paulette Bethel, Excellencies and Distinguished Guests. I am so honored to be here for the launch of this extraordinary report. I have the wonderful privilege of offering you an artist's perspective today. And if I may, I'd like to use my personal experience to stress the tremendous power of culture. My childhood in New Orleans was not always easy. My parents had to push very hard for all five of my brothers and sisters, including myself, uh, just to put food on the table and to give us an education. It was a difficult economic environment. Faced with these challenges, I sometimes struggled to maintain my confidence, my hope in the future. Fortunately, I had music. 
I started to sing in my church choir and my school choir. It was like having a magic key. I started to feel like I was somebody. I felt happy and secure because I always love sharing my voice. Music has made me who I am and allowed me to transcend all of the challenges I face. So for the past year, my mission has been to give other people the same opportunity. In 2010, my associate Aurélie Giroux and I set up the I Sing program in the town of Charleville, Missouri, France. We offer free singing lessons uh, and music for everyone who wanted to attend. Um, children, men, women, the elderly, the employed, and the unemployed. Just the simple act of coming together, well, it changed people. It helped create a sense of hope and solidarity in the town. When I saw what I Sing could do, I decided to expand the program. So with the help of UNESCO, I'm very honored that I'll be taking the I Sing program to several parts of Africa with the specific goal of empowering young girls and women. That's why the program is now transformed into I Sing for Change. So what I've witnessed in my career is that culture transform individuals, then communities, then countries, then the world. We must never underestimate its power and potential. The bottom line is, is that culture is not just something that's nice to have. It is as fundamental to human progress and peace as education. But us artists don't operate in vacuum. We need support from government, resource, and infrastructure. And this is why the UN's report is so important because it makes a powerful case for investing in culture. Culture, culture drives economic development, but it does so much more. It must be part of the two of the post-2015 development agenda because we need it in today's world maybe more than ever. Now, I'm a singer and I can't imagine being here without singing a song for you. Them that's God shall get, them that I shall lose, and the Bible says that it is good news. Your mama may have and your papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own. Yes, the strong gets more, while the weak ones fade. Empty pockets never, never make the grave. Oh, yes, your mama may have and your papa may have. Oh, but God bless the child who's got his own. Oh, 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 oh. money, hey, you got lots of friends. They'll be crowding round your door. Oh, oh. When you're gone and when you're gone and when your spending ends, they won't, they won't come round no more. Rich relations give crust of bread and such. You can help yourself, but don't you take too much. Oh no, your mama may have and your papa may have, God bless the child that's got his own, that's got his own. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, uh, thank you for this powerful message. Uh, we have 600 people waiting outside, so I'm going to cut all my closing. What I want to say is just one line, that you are all here composing a new global symphony of culture and diversity from all the people, of all the people, and for all the people, towards prosperity for all. And I thank you so very much. And the job is not done as the... Uh, Madam Hannah Clark said, uh, the new journey is uh, just began, and let's take the journey together. And thank you, and thank you for all.